Okay, well, our first presentation on partial derivatives was rather conceptual, and basically we talked about how if we have a function of two variables, we can take derivatives in the direction of the x-axis and in the direction of the y-axis. The second presentation we had on the chain rule was very computational, and that is computational muscle that we will use now as we talk about directional derivatives. Basically, the idea can be motivated, for example, through physics, uh, any physicist will tell you that as you describe nature, you are free within certain limitations to choose your coordinate system. And uh, that means that even though it is certainly quite natural for many situations to simply, let me see if I can do the shadow boxing right, to choose a coordinate system where, say, your y-axis goes up and the x-axis goes from your left to your right, uh, any rotated coordinate system would work the same way. The physics would be the same. The description of the physics would certainly change because now you've got a different frame of reference, but that is simply something that we have to deal with mathematically. What that means on the mathematical side is that even though partial derivatives are ultimately tied to the coordinate system that we choose, there shouldn't be anything special. We should also be able to take derivatives in the directions of other straight lines and that's indeed what we're going to talk about here and from a very simple computation to get these directional derivatives uh, the gradient will emerge and the gradient is certainly a central idea to physics to anything that has to deal with potential fields so let's take a look at what these things are so as I said uh, there's nothing special about partial derivatives except that those planes that we intersect the function with uh, are parallel to the coordinate planes, right? And so in this presentation we will compute derivatives in arbitrary directions and basically the idea is that if we have a function of two variables that would mean that we intersect the function with arbitrary vertical planes. The visualization then of course gets more challenging for functions of more than two variables but the geometry is actually quite pretty if we're looking at this. If we want to take a derivative in a slanted direction like across this thing well then we would just, just simply uh, intersect with a plane that is tilted at an angle to the axis and when we do that let's let it come around again we take the intersection we then get again this slice here and for this slice we can take derivatives and compute tangent lines for example all right so this idea uh, then also has a dynamic aspect so if we go back to this one here real quick Basically, the point that moves along here moves along at a certain speed. It's fairly rapid, right? And what can happen is that if you do geometrically the same thing, but go along this slice a little bit more slowly, you will get the same geometry, you will get the same tangent lines, but if you're interested in the velocity vector of this particle that moves along here, then the velocity vector at every point will have the same direction at, as, the as the one at the corresponding point in the previous animation, but the velocity vector will be shorter because in this animation the particle moves at a, at a lower speed than in the previous animation. So that's the kind of thing that we will have to contend with. All right, so if we look at this in a regular x, y, z coordinate system and we just visualize it with a function of two variables, in the usual fashion. What we're interested in is a point at which, a point x, y, at which we want to take a derivative in a certain direction, and typically that'll be a direction that basically defines a straight line. And then, well, uh, that, that straight line, if we plug that straight line into the function, we get, of course, then a function that depends on the single parameter of the straight line that goes in and outputs only the z value, so we get a function of one variable, which is something we can differentiate. And so now then here we have the co point that is corresponding to x, y. Here is the uh, direction vector. Notice that we can travel along the straight line in this direction as well as in the other direction. We choose to go uh, in the negative x direction here, actually. <coughs> and what that then gives us is <coughs> a direction vector as I said and the derivative in that direction will give us 
the slope of a tangent line. Okay, and so this is the geometric aspect of the whole thing. But remember that we will ultimately work with functions of arbitrarily many variables, in which case, or for which, these kinds of things are basically just, vis just simpler visualizations. So, the abstract definition is, if we have a function of n variables, three variables, four variables, two variables, doesn't matter, uh, and we let a be the position vector of the point a, which is x, y here, and let d be a unit vector, and we will talk about that being a unit vector in just a minute, but it needs to be one for this definition. Well, then the directional derivative uh, of f at a in the direction d is, if it exists, it's denoted d subscript direction vector f at a. It's the limit as h goes to 0 of f of a plus h times the direction minus f of a divided by h. Okay, so, and that is just the same thing as the derivative with respect to time at t equals 0 of the function f of a plus t times d. All right, let's, let's take a look at this difference quotient here first. Basically, any time we take derivatives, it's basically a difference quotient. What do we do in a difference quotient? We take a base point, and at that point we find our value. So here's our base point, that's a. And this height here is, is the value of the function at that base point. And then we take a small step in a certain direction away from that base point. So that's basically what we're doing in this direction d here. And what we then get is, of course, another point. And when we have that, we can compute the difference in the output values. Right? This one is higher than that one, which means we would get a positive difference here. And if we then also divide by the step length in the input, well, then what we get is this, the slope of a secant line, and just like these secant lines in one variable tilted towards a tangent line, the same thing happens here also, because if you were to try to visualize a plane that slices through this three-dimensional picture so that it, con that it contains exactly this line and this slice, then the tilting would be exactly the animation that you have seen in the first presentation on derivatives of single variable functions. So that is the, uh, the geometric aspect. The dynamic aspect is, is a little bit obscured or taken care of in that we're taking a unit vector. We know that unit vectors are pure directions and we are interested in a directional derivative only, right? We have plenty of vectors that point in the same direction as d. They could have length 15, they could have length 10 to the negative 10 or something like that. But basically what that would do in this difference quotient here, it would change the step length. And as we change the step length, we would ultimately get a different derivative. And so basically what this definition says is that the function that we plug into our function f is so that our particle moves along the straight line at unit speed. And that then also certainly brings us to this interpretation here that we're also going to use. Because basically what we have done is we have taken the function f and we have plugged in the function a plus t times direction d, which is a straight line. And if we take the derivative of that thing at t equals 0, well, at t equals 0 we get f of a. And if we set up the difference quotient, then at t equals h we get f of a plus h times d. And dividing by h gives us exactly the difference quotients that we would want to have for this function of t. All right, so proposition, <clears throat> if we have a function of n variables and if ei is the ith unit vector, uh, which means that all components of this vector ei are 0 except for the ith component, which is 1, well, then the partial derivative with respect to xi exists. And it exists, oh, it exists if and only if the directional derivative in the direction of the unit vector ei exists. And uh, if both derivative exists, uh, derivatives exist, then we have that the partial derivative of f with respect to xi is the directional derivative of f in the direction of ei. And the proof is fairly simple because if you take the direction of f in the direction of ei at a, well, that's the limit as h goes to 0, f of uh, base point plus h times the direction, f of a plus h times ei, minus f of a divided by h. 
And if you write that out, remember that the ith unit vector has only one component, that is 1, and that's the ith component. So this thing here is nothing but a1 through ai minus 1, which don't change. Then you add h times 1 to ai, and then ai plus 1 through an don't change again. You subtract from that f of a, which is f of a1 through a n, and you divide by h. And if you look back at that presentation, that's exactly the definition of the partial derivative. So that means these two limits are basically the same. One exists if and only if the other one exists. And when they exist, they are both equal. OK, now, don't worry. We're not going to start doing proofs for a living here. But this is a comparatively simple proof that, that we can certainly weave in. Well, we're not quite used to working with that many symbols. But nonetheless, this is something that if we really strain ourselves in that abstract direction, we ought to be able to understand it. Also, uh, we're just going to have one more example to, uh, that uses difference quotients. Uh, then we'll talk a lot about the gradient. And then we'll get back to difference quotients again when we talk about pathological examples. Because basically, any time things really get rough uh, in the pathological sense, then the, uh, the computational methods often fail. And that's when we step back to difference quotients. OK, so as an example, how we use difference quotients. If we're looking at the function f of xy being x squared y over x squared plus y squared when xy is not equal to the origin and 0 at the origin, we want to compute all directional derivatives of that function at the origin, if they exist. Well, I will simply make my direction the vector cosine theta sine theta. And basically, there are two ways to set up direction vectors. I could set it up as a, b, and then demand that a squared plus b squared is equal to 1. And that's something that we'll do a lot when we do some, some more concrete computations. But it seems, and, and that's just a feeling I'm getting from experience, when we're doing something like this, where we uh, work with potentially pathological examples with these piecewise definitions, it is faster and easier to use cosine theta, sine theta. OK, so now the direction, directional derivative of f at the origin would be, well, it's the limit as h goes to 0 of the function at h times direct origin, which is 0, 0, so it doesn't occur, plus h times the direction, so h cosine theta sine theta, minus value of the function at the origin divided by h. OK, f of 0, 0 is 0, so that goes away. And so we just need f of h cosine theta h sine theta. So x is h cosine theta, and y is h sine theta. So that would give us here h squared cosine squared theta h sine theta. And then here it gives us h squared cosine squared theta h squared sine squ plus h squared sine squared theta. And so that is then, of course, as we collect it, we get an h squared from here and an h from the y. That gives us this h cubed, the cosine squared comes from the x squared, and the sine comes from the y. I'll try to highlight it a little bit better. The h squared in the denominator, well, x squared plus y squared is h squared cosine squared theta plus h squared sine squared theta. And that's just h squared using trigonometric Pythagoras. We still divide by h. And we have here also that f of 0, 0 is 0. OK. But that means that we've got h cubed divided by h squared, and then the division by h gives us another division by h here, actually. So we've got h cubed cosine squared theta sine theta divided by h cubed, which gives us cosine squared theta sine theta. And since that does not depend on h, I can directly take the limit as h goes to 0. And so that means that the directional derivative of this function in the direction theta is in the direction of the, the angle theta of the x-axis is cosine squared theta sine theta. And that is something that we can also take a nice look at. Here is the function. It's this nice butterfly-like shape. And we have that the derivative is cosine squared theta sine theta. So if theta equals 0 is here, cosine squared theta sine theta makes this oscillation all the way around the origin. And it's 0 along the axes, because cosine theta is equal to 0 for theta being 0 and theta being pi. And sine theta is equal to 0 for theta being pi halves and theta being 3 pi halves. And so it's, it's something that oscillates around like this. And so we can see that this function is nice and continuous. Like I said, I always remind, 
This shape always reminds me of, of something like a butterfly and uh, we get nice uh, straight derivatives in all the directions that come off the coordinate axes here. And so that is a function that has uh, directional derivatives. We will revisit this function when we actually talk about the multivariable notion of differentiability and we will see that this function actually is not differential in the multivariable sense. We can sort of see that here because if we come in from this direction we come in at a slope of negative one and if we then go out in this direction we come out at a slope of zero. So this thing even though it doesn't quite look like it, it, it has something like corners at this point. All right, back to business here. Uh, basically, who really wants to work with difference quotients? And yeah, me neither. Okay, every so often, like I said, when we talk about things that get really technical or even pathological, we may not have a choice. But anytime we have something that lends itself to computation, we certainly want to use differentiation rules. So that's what we get next. If we take the directional derivative of the function of f at a in the direction of d, then as I mentioned on that panel that had the definition, that is the derivative with respect to time of the function f of a plus t times d at t equals zero, right? Because the directional derivative is that we are plugging a straight line into our function and then we are differentiating that straight line at the point where we're interested in the directional derivative, which is most conveniently achieved if we take the point that we're interested in as the base point for the straight line and then just let the direction radiate off of that. Okay, so we have in this long and computational presentation that we just did on the chain rule, we have seen how to differentiate something like that, right? Because this is just a function with multiple outputs plugged into a function that has multiple inputs. And one way to look at the chain rule was that the chain rule told us this is df dx1, df dxn all the way through, times the derivative with respect to time of a plus t times d, and we take the whole thing at t equals zero. You can go back to the chain rule presentation, that's what it is. You take your outer function, differentiate it with respect to every one of the variables in the middle, and then you take those input variables and differentiate them all with respect to the variable that you want with respect to which you want to differentiate which is what we're doing here by differentiating this vector valued function. Okay so that is really nice because that shows us a much simpler computation for directional derivatives than the chain rule. Ah then the oh come on then difference quotient. There we go. If we plug in t equals zero, of course, this is just df dx1 of a all the way through df dxn of a dot product with the direction vector d. And so here's the definition. If a function u of x1 through xn is so that all first partial derivatives at the point a1 through an exist, and so that all input variables are interpreted as space variables, that's something uh, basically, the gradient is typically physically associated with space, so I wanted to weave that in here also. But then we have, then we define the gradient of the function u at a1 through xn to be gradient of u at a1 through an to be also nabla. We'll talk about that in just a minute. This is the Hebrew letter nabla of u at a1 through an, and it's just derivative of u with respect to x1 at the point a, derivative of u with respect to x2 at the point a, all the way through the derivative of u with respect to xn at the point a. And a corresponding definition then is the nabla operator, is the formal vector nabla being partial with respect to x1, partial with respect to x2, all the way to partial with respect to xn, and that basically then tells us, okay, this is the notation here. If you understand, if you know this operator, then the gradient is just this operator multiplied with the function u in the way that scalars are multiplied with vectors. Okay, so you know me, I don't like to memorize things. The Nabla operator and the gradient, memorize them. Do whatever it takes to have those patterns burned into your mind right away because the Nabla operator as well as the gradient are physically highly relevant 
and we don't want to be tripped up by just not remembering the operator. Okay, sermon ends, we move on. Uh, what we know now is therefore that if you have a multivariable function so that all partial derivatives are continuous at the point A, and if D is a unit vector, then the directional derivative of F at A in the direction D is directional derivative of F at A in the direction D is the gradient of F at A dot product with the direction vector. And so that is one of the first relevances of the gradient that it allows us to compute directional derivatives. The gradient is a whole lot more. We'll talk about that when we interpret the gradient. But let's first get used to what the gradient can do for us. The other thing that we notice in this proposition, again here, remember that d needs to be a unit vector. And that is because we want the directional derivative to be a geometric quantity that is not influenced by how fast we move along that straight line that we technically plug into this function, right? If this was not a unit vector, then this d would have an extra magnitude factor. And that extra magnitude factor, of course, would change this dot product and we would get a different number. And uh, that is something that we want to avoid if we have a geometric quantity that only depends on the direction of this vector d. So that's why, again, we want to have the vector d to be a unit vector. Okay, so that was another quick sermon because that's a common mistake that I've also seen in classes. Okay, we move on. Let's take a first example. We want to compute the directional derivative of the function f of x, y, z equals x squared plus y, z in the direction of the vector negative 2, 3, 1 at the point a equals 1, 0, and 2. Notice that we are already looking here at a function of three variables, which means all these visualizations that we had earlier on are just that. They are just visualizations. Everything that we do works in three dimensions, four dimensions, five dimensions, and so on. The nice thing here is that problems like this with the proposition that we had on the previous panel really is just computation because what do we need to do? We need to compute the gradient and the gradient is the Nabla operator d dx d dy d dz, right? Derivatives with respect to all the input variables, be they x1 through xn or xyz of the function, right? So it's just vector times something that is a scalar quantity, but always keep in mind that Nabla is really just a formal vector. It is not a vector in the sense that you can stick it into three-dimensional space. Some people with really good physical intuition may argue against that. And I think if we had an argument like that, I would argue that they typically talk about actually Nabla being applied to something. Uh, but that is ultimately a question of philosophy. Here, we're just going to compute. And what is this? Well, the x derivative is 2x, the y derivative is z, the z derivative is y. So we take those derivatives, well, just scalar multiplication, only that it happens from the right here, which technically is a little bit unclean, but hey, we can do that. And then it's 2x, z, and y. We need the gradient at the point 1, 0, 2. Well, 2 times 1 is 2. 2 is 2, and 0 is 0, so this is 2, 2, 0. We need a direction vector, and here we need to be careful, because this is a vector, but it's not a unit vector, right? So the direction vector is actually that we take this vector in the direction of which we want to have the derivative, which is negative 2, 3, and 1, and we divide it by its magnitude because we know we can turn any non-zero vector into a unit vector by dividing it by its magnitude. So I get 1 over 4 plus 9 plus 1, sum of the squares of the components, and that's 1 14th, and then the vector still is negative 2, 3, and 1. And the derivative of f in the direction of this d uh, at the point 1, 0, 2, therefore is gradient at 1, 0, 2 dot d. And that's 2, 2, 0 dot 1 over root 14, negative 2, 3, 1, right here. And if we work that out, what do we get? We get negative 4 plus 6, so 1 over root 14 times negative 4 plus 6, well, plus 0 technically. And that ends up being 2 over root 14, and if you want to rationalize denominators, that ends up being root 14 over 7. So this is definitely as straightforward a computation as we can get in multivariable calculus. It certainly still needs to be done. It is something where we have quite a few things to do. We have to talk about the geometry of three-dimensional space, if you will. 
and we have to do dot products and we have to take three or at least several derivatives depending on how many dimensions we have in our function but overall it's all stuff that we ought to be familiar with. Alright, now something else we can do is we can take, and here's where I want to have a visualization again, we can take a function of any number of variables, but for this example we take two variables, f of x, y equals x cubed minus y squared, and I want to find the direction in which the directional derivative at the point 1, 2 is equal to 4. Well, how do you do that? Well, basically you set up your direction vector, and I tried to work this problem with a direction vector cosine theta sine theta, and because we ultimately have to find what this vector is, the trigonometry gets just horrible. So I think for problems like this, it is really more adequate to set up our direction vector as a vector a, b. However, then we have to remember that a squared plus b squared is 1, which means we will actually get a system of equations. And so if we had set something up where we have f of x, y, z, well, then we would have a direction vector a, b, c, and a squared plus b squared plus c squared equals 1, with computations getting correspondingly uglier. Uh, we need the gradient, and the gradient is nabla times your input function, and so that'll be ddx x cubed minus y squared and ddy x cubed minus y squared, so that's 3x squared and negative 2y as the components. And we want to find the directional derivative at 1, 2, which would be that we need the gradient at 1, 2, and the gradient at 1, 2 would be 3 times 1 squared, which is 3, and negative 2 times 2, which is negative 4. And what we then want is that 4 is equal to the directional derivative at 1, 2, and that would be gradient at 1, 2 dot d, and that's 3, negative 4 dot ab, which is d, and that gives us that 4 has to be equal to 3a minus 4b. And that means that if I now solve for b here, that uh, 4b is equal to 3a minus 4, and that means b is 3 quarters a minus 1. And I think, yeah, here's my uh, box that hopefully we will ultimately just enjoy because the rest is really just computation. We have talked our way through here what we need to do. We need to find a direction in which the directional derivative is 4, and really the whole concept is then basically the whole key to the problem is this chain of equations. You just take your desired directional derivative and set it equal to your gradient dot the direction, where the direction is now a vector that we have to find, and we know that a squared plus b squared equals 1. Okay, so now we have this equation, and we need to compute. Well, we have to solve equation, a system of two equations for two variables. One of the equations is linear, so that's nice. We already have solved that for b, and so now we just plug in. So we get a squared plus b squared equals 1. That means a squared plus 3 quarters a minus 1 quantity squared is 1, and that means that a squared plus multiply it out. 3 quarters squared is 9 sixteenths a squared plus 2ab, so minus 2 times 3 quarters times 1, 2 times 3 quarters a times 1, so that minus 3 halves a, uh, plus the last one squared, and so that would be plus 1 squared. Yeah, I should have, should have not said a plus b squared here, but that's how I remember the binomial formula, of course. The one on the right side is still here. Uh, this, I think, is, is a bit of an accident, but it's a nice one because what it tells us is that the ones cancel, and so that means that our quadratic equation is actually fairly nice to solve. See, the negative 3 has a stays, and uh, 16 over 16 plus 9 over 16 is, of course, 25 over 16 for the a squared as the coefficient. That gives us a times 25 over 16 a minus 3 halves equals 0, and that therefore gives us now this equation, and we also know that b is 3 quarters a minus 1. And then, of course, on one hand we get a equals 0, and when a is equal to 0, then b is equal to 3 quarters times 0 minus 1, which is negative 1. And if 25 sixteenths a minus 3 halves is equal to 0, then a is uh, 16 over 25 times 3 halves, and uh, that gives us then, because 16 over 2 is 8, you get 3 times 8 over 25, which is 24 over 25. And then b is 3 quarters times 24 over 25 minus 1. 24 over 4 is 6, so you get 18 over 25 minus 1, and that's negative 7 over 25. And, uh, well, now we can certainly also 
take a look at that. And that's what we want to do just to see what this does. And that's why I wanted to have a two-dimensional example. You can see this function actually around that point is a pretty steep sheet. And uh, we also have the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the contour plot here. And what we have is we have two directions in which the, uh, the um, magnitude of the directional derivative is 4. And that would be, let's take the easier one first, a equals 0, b equals negative 1. So that would be straight down the y-axis. So that is going straight down this way. And the other direction would be a equals 24 over 25 and b equals negative 7 over 25. So that's going at, ne at slightly negative slope in the direction of the x-axis. So that is going this way somehow. And basically what this means is, if we interpret this as a mountain range, and we could do that, then a direction of climb that goes at four units up for every one unit over would be straight down or slightly at negative slope in the direction of the x-axis. And that all works out here. These numbers are negative, so as we get to smaller absolute values, we really are going up. Okay, so this is something that is rather nice if, if you are interested maybe in, in climbing or so you can find certain uh, certain steepnesses but it turns out that there is actually quite a bit of physical meaning in this also and I think that's where we're headed next exactly so because the directional derivative of a function in the direction d at a is the gradient of a dot the direction we have the following uh, if a function of several variables with continuous partial derivatives is given, then the largest possible value for the directional derivative of f at a, well, that would be the largest that this dot product can be. And a dot product is largest when the vectors are parallel, which means when your direction is parallel to the gradient, then you get the largest possible value. And, well, the direction would be gradient divided by the own, own the gradient's magnitude itself, and so when you multiply that by the magnitude of the gradient to get the dot product here, you get that the largest possible value for the directional derivative is the magnitude of the gradient. Let me say that again. The largest magnitude of a dot product would be the product of the magnitudes of the factors, right? This one has magnitude 1, which means the largest possible magnitude is the gradient of f at a, and the direction, well, the direction is um, uh, the, the largest magnitude is assumed when the, when the vectors are parallel, and that would be when your direction vector is the gradient divided by the magnitude of the gradient. The smallest possible value for the directional derivative of f at a, that would be we also have to include negative numbers, and that means the smallest value that a dot product can assume is negative the product of the magnitudes, which would be, in this case, negative gradient f of a, because remember d has magnitude 1, and the negative product of the magnitude is assumed when the vectors are anti-parallel, which means when d points in the opposite direction of the gradient, so that is when d is negative gradient divided by the magnitude of the gradient. And that is highly important, because what that tells us is that the direction, uh, that the gradient not only gives us the magnitude of the steepest ascent as well as the steepest, de steepest descent, it also gives us the direction of the steepest ascent as well as the negative gradient gives us the direction of the steepest descent. And that has immense physical importance. Because if the gradient gives us the direction of steepest ascent, well, what does that mean? That means that in any kind of contour plot, if I want to know what the fastest way is to go up, I would follow the gradient. The gradient would be this thing here, right? The gradient wouldn't go in this direction because I've got a faster way to go up in this direction, say. Uh, and so that would be where the gradient points. And if we now go completely away from the beautiful geometry that we do in mathematics classes, which is nice, but which ultimately is only part of the story, let's think about energy exchange. And energy exchange usually is maximal in the direction of the negative gradient. If this was a temperature, well, let's, let's, let's think of potential energy here. If this is a mountain range, if you pour some water on the mountain range here, 
it's not going to go this way. It's going to go straight down. Nature goes the way of least resistance, if you will, right? If this was a temperature field, then uh, heat energy would flow in the direction of the negative gradient because the warm parts would try to cool and would try to transfer heat energy to the cooler parts. So energy exchange usually is maximal in the direction of the negative gradient, which is the direction of steepest descent. And that means that is independent of whether we are considering potential energy or heat or something else. So any time in physics you have energy encoded in terms of, what if, of a potential, the gradient will tell you the direction in which energy exchange preferably happens. And that is ultimately important for the derivation of various partial differential equations of mathematical physics. Uh, as an example, well, if we just want to know for this function x cubed minus y squared at the point 1, 2, what the direction of steepest ascent and the slope in that direction is, that's another one. It's just computation because we know what to do. The di we did just most of it. We'll, we'll go through it again. We need the gradient. The gradient is nabla x cubed minus y squared, which is partial with respect to x of x cubed minus y squared, partial with respect to y of x cubed minus y squared, which is 3x squared and negative 2y. The gradient at 1, 2 is still 3, negative 4. The magnitude of the gradient will be the magnitude of 3, negative 4, which is the square root of 19 plus 16, which is the square root of 25, which is 5. And the gradient divided by the gradient's magnitude is just 1 -fifth negative uh, 3, negative 4. And that is that we now have the direction of steepest ascent, which is this vector here. Highlighting again is balking at me. There we go. That looks a lot prettier. The direction of steepest ascent is here. And the uh, slope in that direction is 5. And if we go back to our visualization, uh, let's see this. Remind myself real quick. 3, negative 4. So you go over and down, and you go a little bit more down than over. And so if you look at this field here, yeah, this direction is apparently really where you're, you're having your, your steepest incline. Okay, uh, that was that one. And uh, well, we keep interpreting the gradient. And if you're looking at it another way, basically steepest ascent and stagnation are perpendicular concepts to each other. Stagnation is exactly the opposite of steepest ascent, right? So they, they shouldn't have in any way common directions. And so if we want to look at it in the following way. We have a theorem. If you have a function of several variables with continuous partial derivatives, and we keep demanding continuous partial derivatives so we can apply the chain rule in the form that we have already derived, ultimately, actually, you can just get away with a function satisfying the abstract notion of multivariable differentiability. But we preserve that for the next presentation, because that's going more in the direction of dealing with pathologies and ultimately getting a beautiful definition that beautiful definition that avoids these various things. Right now we just need a theorem that works. If c of t is a differentiable vector valued function so that f of c of t is a constant function, so something that travels inside a level surface if you will, then for all t we have that the gradient of f on the curve dot c prime of t times the direction of the curve is zero and that means that something that stagnates, the direction of stagnation is any direction in which the curve goes because f of c of t is constant, that is perpendicular to the direction of steepest ascent for f, which is encoded by the gradient. In terms of proving this, well, f of c of t is constant, so for all t we have that 0 is the derivative of f of c of t, and we know the derivative of f of c of t is gradient of f of c of t dot c prime of t, so this is a fairly quick result to prove abstractly, but the visualization is nice because if we're looking at a level surface, f of x, y, z equals k, and if we now let a curve travel inside that level surface, that curve is c of t, then I know from the previous theorem that at any point on the curve, the gradient of f is perpendicular to the curve itself. So that means really that stagnation and steepest ascent really are perpendicular to each other. And that, let's see what we're going to say here, and that leads us now to this idea of a tangent plane, which is ultimately really what uh, mathematicians geometrically would like to get out of differentiability. 
So if we take a look at a level surface and we look at a point, A, then at that point we can put all sorts of curves through that point and all these curves stay inside the level surface and the gradient is perpendicular to all those curves and that means the plane that is perpendicular to the gradient ought to fit all these curves inside the level surface really really smoothly and therefore should be what a tangent plane does. A tangent plane should contain all the tangent lines to all the various curves that we can put inside that level surface. And uh, yeah, so that means we should be able to use the gradient to define tangent planes to level surfaces and the definition is if we have a function of several variables and we have a point with f of a equals k for which the gradient at that point a exists then the set of points R with gradient of f at a dot r minus a equals zero that's the vector equation of a plane right normal vector dot something that ought to be in the plane is supposed to be equal to zero that set of points will be called the tangent plane or hyperplane of the level surface or hypersurface f equals k at a and so don't mind the, the hyper part here basically when this is a function of three variables this would really be called the tangent plane however if it's a function of four variables it would be called the tangent hyperplane and uh, f equals k for a function of three variables is a level surface for functions of more than three variables it's called often a hypersurface that's just indicating that we're in, in dimensions that there are so many that visualizations get really, really ugly or really hard. If it's a function of two variables, we'll call this thing the tangent line of the level curve. Okay, so as an example, if we take the function f of x, y, z equals x squared plus y squared plus z squared, a very simple function, and we want to compute the tangent plane to the surface f of x, y, z equals 1 at the point a equals 1 over root 3, 1 over root 3, 1 over root 3. Well, that point really is on that level surface because 1 over root 3 squared is 1 third and if I've got three of those and add them up I really get one. Well basically I take the gradient and the gradient uh, is 2x, 2y, 2z and at that point it'll be two, time, 2 over root 3, 2 over root 3, 2 over root 3 so I get 2 over root 3 times 1, 1, 1. We obtain gradient dot point on the plane x, y, z minus 1 over root 3 times 1, 1, 1, which is the point A equals 0, and that is the level surface. So the computation is straightforward. You just want to, and, and you do want to know that formula. Again, you basically piece it, to, you can piece it together from the idea that the gradient has to be perpendicular to the level surface and from fully understanding the vector equation of a plane. But now let's also think about that x squared plus y squared plus z squared set equal to 1. That's a unit sphere. That's something that we can visualize. And so we can now also uh, try to visualize it. And before we do that, uh, let's simplify this a little bit here. So the 2 thirds, because the right side is 0, I, the 2 over root 3, because the right side is 0, I can multiply that over. I get 1, 1, 1 dot x minus 1 over root 3, y minus 1 over root 3, z over minus 1 over root 3. And that, of course, is x minus 1 over root 3 plus y over minus 1 over root 3 plus z minus 1 over root 3, because we had a dot product with 1, 1, 1. And that gives us x plus y plus z equals 3 over root 3, uh, which is root 3. And that's z equals root 3 minus x minus y. And now I want to visualize. So let's talk our way into that again. x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1. That's a unit sphere. That's something we can draw. That's something we can take a nice look at. So here's the unit sphere, and if we're looking at the axes, I think are all set up in the usual way. Um, not quite here. Let's see, how does this go? Uh, yeah, my, my first octant has to be over here, and so now we have x going in this direction, y going in this direction, z going up. Here's the point, 1, 1, 1, and... What we are interested in is, whoops, that's that's the source code. Sorry, that's what the source code looks like for these slides. Um, so z is root 3 minus x minus y. We also see that in this visualization here that we're going down in the positive x direction. We're going down in the positive y direction. And uh, on the whole, of course, we can also see that if we rotate this around here, yeah, this is a 
plane that really smoothly fits the sphere, it is something that we would really want to call the tangent plane because it, it fits that idea of a tangent plane very nicely, independent of which from which direction we look at it. Okay, so that means we potentially have tangent planes. And so let's summarize the meaning of the gradient. What did I say at the beginning? The gradient is the really important concept here, even though we also want to compute directional derivatives. The gradient points in the direction of steepest ascent. The gradient's magnitude is the slope in that direction. The gradient can be used, and, and we've got that out of the chain rule as well as out of the fact that we can use the gradient to compute directional derivatives. Uh, the gradient is perpendicular to level curves and surfaces, and that means the gradient is a normal vector of tangent planes and lines of level surfaces and curves if these tangent lines and planes exist. Remember that butterfly type surface that we had at the beginning? We're going to see in the next presentation that this thing, and we can also, also already see it geometrically here, this one would be really hard to fit a plane to because what do you fit the plane to? This slope that actually is 1 or minus 1 or this slope that is zero, right? That's what's going to make this thing here not differentiable, as mathematicians say. But we can also look at it from another point of view, and here's again where the pathology completely takes over. I want us to take a look at the function f of x, y being x cubed y over x to the 6 plus y squared when x, y is not the origin, and zero when x, y is equal to the origin, at zero, zero. And we want to show that at 0, 0, this thing has directional derivatives in every direction. Well, we take our direction vector to be cosine theta, sine theta. Again, that's going to make the algebra easier because I've got one function and only one variable. Uh, so the direction vector of f at 0, 0 in the direction d would be the limit as h goes to 0, f of h times the direction vector cosine theta, sine theta minus the value at the origin, which is, of course, 0. And now if we plug everything in, well, we get an h cubed from x cubed and an h from the y, so we get an h to the fourth overall. We get x is h cosine theta, so with the x cubed we get a cosine cubed. Uh, y is h sine theta, and that means from the y we get the h, which is already uh, absorbed here, times sine theta. And in the denominator we get, well, uh, these have, a, have an h squared in common that I can factor out, and then we still have an h to the fourth here in the x, and then x, of course, is the h cosine uh, theta quantity to the sixth, and the y is the h sine theta quantity raised to the sixth. And when I simplify that, I have a division by h squared and another division by h, so ultimately I divide by h cubed, and I get the limit as h goes to zero of h cosine cubed theta sine theta divided by h to the fourth cosine to the sixth theta plus sine squared theta, and I claim that that limit is zero independent of theta. And that's because as long as sine theta is not equal to zero, it doesn't matter that this h to the fourth makes this stuff get small. As h gets small, the denominator will be about sine squared theta, and the numerator will go to zero because of h. So when sine theta is not equal to zero, the limit will be zero because we have h going to zero and a non-zero denominator. And when sine theta is equal to zero, it doesn't really matter what, what we do because sine theta equals zero gives us a zero in the numerator that is not canceled because the denominator is not zero because of this part here. And so that means we get a limit of zero there also. The annoying thing, however, is that the function is not even continuous as we can see in this final window here. That is this function x cubed y over x to the six plus y squared. It's sort of like that butterfly surface that we've just seen, only this time we've got ridges. And basically what happens is the weakness of directional derivatives is that they come in along straight lines, right? We've already also seen that when we investigated limits, that just because things are fine along straight lines doesn't mean that things can't go wrong along curves. And so basically these ridges, as long as I go towards the origin along straight lines, I will always just go over the hump, and once I'm over the hump, I will go to zero in, in fact, a tangential fashion so that things along that straight line work out 
very nicely, but if I were to go towards zero on along a cube here, I think, I think y equals x cubed would mess things up really good. Well, then I would just stay on top of that ridge, and that would give me certainly also a horizontal slope, but then if I would try to go out in another direction all of a sudden, um, I would have my problems there, and certainly slopes aren't even a an, an issue here because this function is discontinuous, right? If I come in along plus y cubed and go out along minus y cubed, well then I would come in at height 1 or something like that and go out at height minus 1 and I would have this discontinuity that I think we also discussed when we talked about uh, limits of multivariable functions. So this certainly, I think we're done here, so this certainly is for somebody who enjoys geometry as well as for somebody who wants to make sure that the abstract stuff works out nicely, this is a very unsatisfying state of affairs. What we would want to have is a notion of multivariable derivatives that on one hand geometrically gives us a nice notion of a tangent plane that actually works and we have just seen in this example that even though the computation works tangent plane is, is impossible to fit to something that's, that's discontinuous and second of all then on an abstract level also differentiability ought to imply continuity. All right, now, the way this often works in, in calculus texts is that people talk about the notion of the multivariable derivative first, and I've seen that that is, is quite confusing because we have no really good reason to, to mess with this complicated definition, especially if and when applied people typically use partial derivatives and typically use gradients. Well, what we have seen so far is we have seen the power of partial derivatives, we have seen the power of the gradient, we know that we can somehow compute something that ought to be a tangent plane, but there are certain things where reality just doesn't quite play nicely with us. And because of that, we have no choice but to go a little bit more abstract, but I think now we are quite ready for it, so the next presentation is going to be about the multivariable notion of differentiability and about what we actually have to demand from the function so that the tangent plane actually fits smoothly like it did to the sphere and doesn't encounter problems with different slopes like with that butterfly surface or even worse uh, with discontinuity with this thing that had the ridges. Right now, however, first you want to get used to the gradient, you want to do some of the computations so that you don't get tripped up by that as we go conceptual one more time. I'll see you in the next one.